Thank you for joining us this evening. Before we begin, um, I'd like to show my respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this event takes place and uh, show my respect to their elders past and present. Thank you for coming along this evening. My name is Tony Jordan and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to the Wheeler Centre tonight. With me is the fabulous Linda Javen. Linda uh, is very well known as a novelist. Um, I have to read this because of all her skills. Novelist, essayist, playwright, memoirist and short story writer. But we would be here all night if we were to cover all those tonight. So we're just going to talk about her work as a translator and particularly this fantastic quarterly essay found in translation in praise of a plural world. Um, so um, Linda has been translating from Chinese for more than 30 years. She translates subtitles, song lyrics, poetry and fiction and has interpreted for film crews, Chinese artists and musicians and has even translated to, um, for my teen heartthrob, Billy Bragg. I can't wait to ask her <laughs> about that, about um, at the English socialist um, being translated uh, in China. Um, first of all, can you join with me in welcoming Linda? Thank you, thank you, Tony, and thank you all for coming out on such a, on such a, you know, gloomy Melbourne, evening. no normal Melbourne night we call this. Oh, a normal <laughs> Melbourne night, but I really appreciate it. It's lovely to see you all here. Thank you. I really wanted to start the way you started this quarterly essay with um, an anecdote that that I it struck me as being slightly horrifying about George Bush. Would you <laughs> tell us that little story? A horrifying anecdote about George Bush. Imagine that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, about six years ago, I have to open it up because I can never remember these G things. Um, it was at a G8 summit. Um, he was speaking and there was a German interpreter. Um, so he had to stop every so often to let the German interpreter interpret. And he got very impatient. And he said, everybody speaks English, right? <laughs> and uh, Angela Merkel said, be patient, <laughs> and had the translation go on. Um, but I think that that little anecdote encapsulates so much about uh, monocultural worlds, monolingual worlds, the position of English in the world, which, I mean, to some extent, he's almost right. English is the biggest global language. It's the biggest lingua franca, lingua franca which is also called a vehicular language. Many, many people speak it, and many more people speak English who speak it as a second language than people who speak it as a first language. So it's an interesting thing. On this, at the same time, one does need to respect <laughs> other... <laughs> But is he right? I mean, is translation a, a dying and less important art these days because of the spread of English? Well, I think dying and less important, um, sadly, uh, I, think, I don't think translation will ever be a dying. I don't think we'll ever die. But I think its, its importance has been overlooked. And I think one of the points that I make in this essay is that in so many ways, in ways that we are barely aware of, translation binds our world. It makes our life lives possible. It, it inhabits our culture. It inhabits even our language. Even when we speak English, we uh, are speaking a language that has been unbelievably enriched through translation. Um, and yet we don't, we don't get it. We think a machine can do it. You know, we think, oh yeah. Um, but you plug it into Google Translate. It's going to come out. Everybody's going to understand that, right? Well, well actually, uh, there's an, um, a story in here that I tell, which is um, about a Chinese uh, saying, and the Chinese saying has this uh, basis in an, in an historical anecdote about a, call, a king called King Gojian, and King Gojian um, was really badly defeated in a territorial dispute. So he decided that he was going to really just go into total austerity, punish himself, and just build up his strength and take back his land from his enemy. So he did what is called which is to lie on brushwood and uh, taste bile, which means, you know, to just you, you just do the, the, the you know, he's, he was living very, very poorly and he was um, suffering and, and uh, not indulging in any kind of soft life or big life. He had his goal. But the problem is then he regained his land. And after he regained his land, 
because he had spent so many years in that state, um, he had become paranoid and he had become really closed off. And so there was all this, these problems and his reign pretty much fell apart because of that. Um, he could no longer govern in peace. Now, this story is it's quite a complex story, right? You, can't, you can take a number of different morals from it. And over the years, the Chinese have used this expression, wo xin chang gan, in many different ways. So some people say that it's, it, you know, if you want to get something done and it's difficult, you've got to wo xin chang dan. And the lesson that they take and what they mean when they say wo xin chang dan is, you know, you've got to suffer and get through something in order to get to your goal. It's going to be difficult, but you've got to do it that way. Um, but other people mean it as a kind of a lesson about not taking wartime habits into peacetime when you're governing. And then Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao, actually took another lesson from it when he said that uh, his generation was Washin Changdan. They were suffering in the revolution. They were doing all this stuff. But then he said once peace came, he was afraid that in a couple of generations, and he was right, mm -hmm. that the people would get used to living soft and they'd forget all the uh, hardships of the revolution and that would have all been lost. So Washin Changdan... Depends what you're, when right. you're saying it, why you're saying it, and what context. And the point you're trying to make. And the point you're trying to make, it, it can mean many different things. Now, if you put Washing Changdan into Google Translate, as I did as an experiment for this essay, um, what I found was it gave me one word, revival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that doesn't really capture quite what you've explained to no, us, does it? No, but it, translation is terribly important. Is it dying? I don't know. Um, well, so, certainly it's not dying at the moment because uh, as a trading partner and as a, a diplomatic partner, China has never been more important to us. Yes. But I do, and, and we will come back to this, but I do want to ask you about 30 years ago when you began, people must have thought, how did you even begin? Because people must have thought this is the strange, why would you choose a country like this? Why are you not choosing? It was, it was almost, you know, it was one of those things, um, part of my strange, I suppose my personality is just to not really care about practical consequences. I suppose it was Japan um, that was more important. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, seriously, I was in university and I was actually in the States at the time and um, you, the States had no diplomatic relations with China. China was in the Cultural so Revolution. So you thought to yourself, I'm going to choose a country to specialise in that my country has no diplomatic relationships with, that yeah. we're not allowed to travel I, with, and I'm we have no learn, trade whatsoever. I'm going to learn a language, and I might <laughs> never be able to talk to the people. Right. You know? So don't ask. It's really weird. I got interested in Chinese history. Um, I took some courses, got very interested in my Chinese my professor of Chinese history said, you have to take Chinese. I was like, I couldn't do French. <laughs> I was terrible in French. And he said, you have to do Chinese. And I kind of got dragged kicking and screaming into it. Um, and then when I graduated, it was 77. Uh, and Once you started, did you did you develop a, a real love for it? Was oh, the yeah. passion came from that? Yeah, totally. I was already fascinated by the history and then it just went you know the language was just amazing what did you love about the language what I loved about the language is what I think everybody loves about learning another language is that it does several things it lets another culture inhabit your brain and break apart preconceptions and basic ideas that you have about the world. Mm -hmm. It makes you aware of how you live. It makes you aware of how you think, and it makes you aware of what you take for granted and what you think about how, uh, from the very subtle little interactions of daily life into the big um, world views that you might hold, it qu makes you question everything. And the language itself is structured, the culture is embedded in the language. And that's true of French. It's a true of, you know, if you're speaking French, um, and I, I have this in here, but if you're speaking French, um, you have to distinguish between vous and tu. You have to distinguish between the polite form mm -hmm. of you and the normal form of you. Which, it's and, not something we have to do in English. No. And so you suddenly become more polite in French, if you speak it correctly. Um, you know, you walk into a shop in Paris and you address the shopkeeper as vous. And 
it's a different thing. It, it, it really it, it changes your brain. It changes the way you're looking at the world and the way you're interacting with people. And so speaking in Chinese does as well. Um, all those little things. Um, and it's similar. It goes the other way as well. So I also discuss how in the early 20th century, uh, the Chinese, um, well, in the 19th century, China was confronted by a terribly humiliating um, in the the invasion, the aggression and invasions of of um, various imperial powers from uh, the the Western imperial powers, uh, America, uh, Europe, uh, uh, Britain, uh, France, etc., but also Japan. Japan had become very strong and modern from the Meiji period, and so um, China was suddenly being China, which had always considered itself the central country in the world. You know, everybody else was a tribute state, essentially. Um, it was suddenly the weak one, and it was being pummeled by all these, these others. And it was also, it couldn't, it needed to work out why. So its intellectuals were asking, why is this happening? You know, what, what, what's wrong with us? What, what's weak? What's wrong with this culture? Um, and in uh, the early 20th century, a number of Chinese intellectuals, for various reasons, ended up in Japan studying or living in Japan in exile. And they encountered there, they wanted to study what had happened, and they encountered there the words that the Japanese had translated from English right. and from French and from other uh, languages, which had changed the way the Japanese conceived of the world. world. So democracy... Uh, neither Japan, traditional Japan, nor China had the word democracy. That, uh, the word civilization is a concept. Um, they had great civilizations, but they didn't have the concept of civilization as it has evolved from its Greek meaning with citizen and, and, and civility and all of the implications that are carried around there. So it was a Japanese translator in the 19th century who got civilization from reading a French um, a French uh, philosopher, um, and he translated it but used Chinese characters because a lot of Japanese uses Chinese mm -hmm. characters. So he thought, what, what is, he was very impressed by the particular French reading of the word civilization, which had to do with both um, a kind of um, enlightenment. It was basically an enlightenment and a clarification through education and reading. It, it had to do with, with these various concepts. It was, a, it was a, a moral and spiritual civilization as well as a material civilization, the two working together. So he used the two characters, one for one wen, which means literature, vague broadly, and the other ming, which means brightness. And he put that together, literature and brightness, wen ming. So then the Chinese uh, exiles and students we're in Japan, and they go, right, and it's already in Chinese characters, and they go, that's cool. So then they bring Wenming back to China, and that was just one word that they brought back. So translation enabled the transmission mm -hmm. of ideas, mm -hmm. each time becoming slightly different. So, so there's a big argument for what it adds to a culture. Oh, absolutely. But there's also some resistance. Um, a lot of cultures have a resistance to that idea. Yeah, and France is an interesting one. Um, uh, Victor Hugo recognised this resistance when he... Um, um, I can't remember where that bit is. I would read it because Victor <laughs> Hugo is so good. I, I shouldn't paraphrase him. Um, but he talks about... Um, if I can find it quickly, I will. But uh, he talks about the... There's a hostility here. And you also talk about... You quote um, Elliot Weinberger saying oh, yeah. um, national self-loathing has been one of the great spurs to translation. Yes, exactly. I mean, basically what... Um, so that was one of the things with the Chinese who were distressed at their own weakness uh, and very critical of their own culture. They were very critical. They were really critical of Confucius at the time. Um, and so they were looking for alternatives. And they they found this Wenming civilization. They found democracy. They found all these other ideas which they brought back. Victor Hugo talked about uh, translation as acts of violence. Mm. He said, when you offer a translation to a nation, that nation will almost always look on the translation as an act of violence against itself. Bourgeois taste tends to resist the universal spirit. Um, and he, but then he goes, you know, it's to, to translate a foreign writer is to add to your own national poetry. Yet such a widening of the horizon does not please those who profit from it, at least not in the beginning. Wow. 
Have you seen evidence of that? Is there, especially when you're beginning your work as a translator, have you have you uh, met people who thought it was anti-nationalistic or, or something that that you would do that kind of work? No. <laughs> I'm just trying That's to think. Good. I think it it's operates on a more subtle level. Mm-hmm. I think it's that kind of resistance. Um, Australia is interesting. Australia, on the one hand, can be very conservative and, on the other hand, very open and porous. So um, we have a very interesting situation vis-a-vis translation mm-hmm. in that, like the rest of the Western world, we don't we, we get translated out a lot more than we translate in. Um, and I'll just make a slight detour here to just mention that in we don't have good statistics in Australia, but the statistics in America um, are fairly similar to those in the UK and pretty similar to those here, which is that in 1950 uh, in, in the US, something like 11,000 books were published. And of those, uh, something like... 500, I've got the exact figures in here, were translations from another language. Now, that's not a lot, right, out of 11,000. But then in 2010, there were over 200,000 books published in the U.S. And anybody able to guess how many books were published in translation? (laughs) <laughs> Not quite that bad, but 460-something. Mm-hmm. So, Same amount. Yeah, and I think, you know, text publishing has been um, great. Um, there's been a number of publishers who here who have done that. We also, uh, I think we are a little bit more open. We've got the cultural cringe, which actually can work for us in some but ways. But why don't we read more Chinese novelists, for example? Why do we read Murakami or... Or well, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and we, we don't read. So okay, many well, that's Chinese a specific novels. question. Why don't we read Chinese novelists? And this is a question where, you, when you go to China, it's often debated: is it that Chinese literature itself is a little bit crap? Um, <laughs> <Jeez>. You know, <laughs> I'm talking about con- making that argument you know, to them. Yeah, no, Chinese are always talking about this. The thing is, Chinese classical literature is astonishing. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's so beautiful and it's so extraordinary and the Chinese classic novels are just magnificent. Um, And there's some 20th century works that are really, really great. Um, Um, I've read the first bit of um, the the Red Chamber. The Did you read it in Story of the Stone, translated by John Minford and David Hawkes? Uh, no, I read an earlier translation, but I just read the first bit, the first 1,200 pages. <laughs> and um, They are uh, a little long, yes. Yeah, maybe that's, that's the answer. Um, is Were the, you mesmerised? I, I, there was certainly some interesting bits, but what I found was that it was... V- did you see that? There's that diplomacy on my on my feet. Um, it's got a different idea of story than than our kind of yes. Greco-Roman tradition of story. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so the traditional Chinese novels, which are magnificent, don't always translate very well. Mm-hmm. Um, and Simon Lay's Pierre Rickmans has made the point, in fact, that one of China's greatest poets, Du Fu, is doesn't translate very well into English because it. The language is so subtle and is so. There's just something about it doesn't really uh, can't quite get it across. But Han Shan, Cold Mountain, um, has like this, has kind of cult status. He got cult status in the 1950s, and he's translated to Japanese and into English, and everybody loves Han Shan. But Han Shan, who lived at the same time as Du Fu, was really much more of a minor poet in Chinese. So it, it's also about what translates across. So now there's a big debate about whether or not we're not reading a lot of contemporary Chinese work because it's crap or because it doesn't translate well or because people aren't translating it well. Well, that, that's the interesting thing. Can, can a good translator make an average work into a brilliant work? Well, um, yes, um, uh, because, and, but it, the ethics of that are interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm bo- mm. <laughs> you know, Baudelaire um, translated Edgar Allan Poe, and although I haven't read Baudelaire's Poe, uh, in French, obviously, um, it's generally uh, like every everybody says he improved Po. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, and and in Japan, there's a, a publishing house that uses the the. I don't know whether they call themselves Choyaku or whether they um, are published Choyaku, but Choyaku is a Japanese term meaning translations that improve on the original. Wow. Um, so it it can be done, but there's there's all these 
issues around translation. You well, know, with these are very interesting ethical issues, and we will get to those. But first, we must make a, make a slight digression into one of Linda's favourite subjects, which is swearing as an insight <laughs> into cultural differences. <laughs> so I would like to ask Linda a couple of questions about how one translates swear words from one culture to, the, to another, because obviously something that's <laughs> offensive in one culture might not be offensive in another. How do you exactly make that shift? Well, it depends <coughs> what you're doing with, sorry, with the translation. So, for example, um, <laughs> maybe I should just say language warning, ladies and gentlemen. At Everybody this point. <laughs> okay with a C word? Can I say that? Um, the Chinese have a very common swear word. Let's start with this one. It's niu bi. And um, niu bi is uh, literally cow cunt. Maybe okay? we should just still practice no, niu bi so you know right. never to say it yeah. should you go to niu bi. China. Um, and, <laughs> and the thing is, you hear this all the time. Now, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's very strange, isn't it? It's extremely strange. But it also, it's not actually a swear word. That's the strangest part about it. It's actually a way of saying, great, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and it can be used in an ironic sense. You know, it can be, and I give, I give a kind of a, um, a hypothetical two examples for newbie. Uh, one would be um, if, uh, you know, we're trying to go to this restaurant and you said, I called and... They said we have to wait for a month to get a booking. And then I say, let me try. And I call and I say, we've got a table for tonight. And you would look at me and you'd go, newbie. <laughs> That's total praise. But if we go there and we see some guy who's just, you know, hideous, you know, think sort of, I don't know, um, you know, just sort of awful. And he's surrounded by incredibly beautiful young women who seem to adore him. Um, and he's sitting there and he's splashing out his money on them. And he's got this sort of, and we would look at each other, we'd say, newbie. <laughs> <laughs> it's, but that's the thing. But, you know, there are Chinese swears that, um, like there's a Chinese swear uh, that curses your an it, it, it says that your ancestral tablet it, it would destroy your ancestral tra ancestral tablets back several generations uh, and that really would scare an Australian wouldn't it it'd no, be like no. you know <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> um, but it's 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 a general it's a it's and and that tells you something about values and about culture um, it's like I also use this example in here I was out at the movies with an Italian friend in Sydney and he drove me home and um, and we pull up in front of my place and <laughs> and he suddenly sees something on the windscreen because we hadn't realized that he'd parked illegally when we were in the movies anyway seeing on the windscreen and he goes Porco Dio! And, <laughs> and he, he jumps out of the car and he gets the, 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 the parking <laughs> fine. He's like, Porco Dio, Madonna Putana. You know, he's kind of going on like this. And I got Madonna Putana. I could kind of figure that out. But I didn't get Porco Dio at first. And I went, what, what's that mean? And he goes, I'm not telling you. You'll get arrested in Rome. And... <laughs> And so I, I was like, oh, come on, tell me. He goes, no, I'm not telling you. So, of course, I went upstairs and I got online. <laughs> right. And I found out not only does it mean pig god or god is a pig, but what I discovered, which was really fascinating, is that Italian has two types of swears. Um, and one is bestemi, which actually is a, it's like a, a religious um, Blasphemy. Yeah. Blasphemy. blasphemy. It's a kind of a blasphemy swearing. And then the other one, I think it's called parolace, and that's just normal swearing. And he did all, it was all bestemi in that car. Um, but <laughs> but what was, uh, what's interesting is that bestemi was actually outlawed until 1999. It was a misdemeanor. It was a serious crime. And in some localities in Italy to this day, um, it still is considered um, a, a, an offense against the law. Wow. And so you learn a lot about Italian culture and values from knowing that to say that is actually, has actually been a crime. Um, so the way that our culture embeds, the way that we deal with swear words 
Uh, The fact that we swear a lot more easily than Americans um, tells you something about the difference between a culture that, that, uh, uh, you know, an an English-speaking culture that began with convicts and one that began with Puritans. (laughs) I'd like to return um, for the moment to this idea of improving or not and think about the role of of the translator as co-conspirator, if you like, because you're a a writer and novelist, a a novelist as well as a translator. How do you see that ethical dilemma about having a tinker and making things better? I I tinker. Do you? Um, Yeah, I tinker. Um, I... The good thing is that uh, most of my work is done with um, film, and I work with directors like uh, Chiang Kai Gu, whose English now is very, very good. And I've worked with, um, I did uh, Wang Kar Wai's new film, uh, The, the, the uh, Grandmaster. Um, so these are people who know English very well. Mm-hmm. So they see what I'm doing. Um, I also recently did uh, a film by this Chinese rock star called Sui Jian. It was his first uh, de- directorial uh, debut, and he's a very, very big. He's like the granddaddy of Chinese rock and roll. His English is is pretty good. Um, and when I'm working with people like that, I feel a little bit freer because what I do, they will see. Mm-hmm. And if they're not happy, they, you know. So we have a give and take, and we we can talk about it. Uh, I would feel, I wouldn't feel completely comfortable about doing it with people who. I would discuss it with them. Right. You know, I, I did. I do. I must say, I did once. I did something slightly naughty. Uh, I do consider it a great improvement. Um, <laughs> but uh, there was a film, <laughs> and it was, it, it was just lame, and it was supposed to be better, and it was. <laughs> So, so the, a, the question is, would you take a, a job where the work you think is lame? The words are... Well, it was an, an extremely major director, right. okay? And I definitely take jobs from really big major directors because they're interesting, you know? And this one just happened to not be his best film. And uh, I generally... You know, look, a lame film that gives you a lot of money, you know... Okay. Uh, it's okay with Linda. Anyone, it's okay. It's a anyone short Anyone has a pain. big checkbook wants to get it's Linda... A, yeah, it's a short pain, you know? It's just a couple of weeks and... I mean, but I, I obviously love doing films that have... Uh, I love doing films with a really good script, with mm-hmm. beautiful language. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's obviously what the joy of translation is. Um, but uh, this particular film, great director, mediocre film, and it was supposed to be an urban comedy. And the language, you could tell what he was getting at, but he just it didn't quite get there. And there was this one scene where this guy um, says, and he's supposed to be really just kind of street smart and tough, and, and he says... <laughs> I, uh, you know, if he dropped down in front of me, I wouldn't, you know, I can't remember what he said in Chinese, but it was something really dull. It was kind of like, if he dropped down in front of me, I wouldn't help him. It was like, what? You know? <laughs> so I, I <clears throat> contributed the subtitle. <laughs> I wouldn't piss on him if his head was on fire. <laughs> <laughs> So, so let's talk. <laughs> You're getting a very interesting insight into the translator's art. But let's talk for a minute about that process, about how you go about. I mean, do you watch the whole film? Do you get a script? How do you go about changing? Sometimes, um, you know, you're in the movies and there's a long, dramatic speech in some other language and, and, and the line... Okay. Under the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> how, how, do, how does that happen? Um, that, in a practical that, level, like how do yeah. you actually do it? The way it works is this. Um, there's two different possibilities. One is that I get contacted uh, before the final, you know, five minutes, can you do this by tomorrow, you know, that sort of thing. Um, They contact me when the film's being made. Um, Sometimes they want me to translate the script uh, because they're showing it to foreign investors um, or in in the case of Chiang Kai Gu's latest film, um, I was supposed to hand it in today, but I'll hand it in tomorrow, Um, (laughs) uh, uh, translating the script uh, because he's got a Hollywood cinematographer who'll be working with him who doesn't speak Chinese so he needs the English language script. So if I get to look at the script beforehand, that's really great because then I'm reading the entire script. I've got the story in my head. I've got an idea of who the characters are. I've got a pretty good idea of what I'm going to see. But that's that happens maybe, I don't know, one-fourth of the time. Most of the time what happens is I get contacted. There's this film um, and... 
what there is is a working uh, like a working edit. So the director has pretty much put it together. Um, it's pretty much as it's going to be. They've still got to polish off a little bit of here and there, and the editing is going to be tweaked. The music might not be on it, but it's more or less ready. And so I'll get the film. And it used to be that they would uh, FedEx a video um, if I wasn't in China. And now there are secure sites where upload, download. Um, so it's and that's because of piracy or oh yeah and and the film always comes with um, my name uh, watermarked over it so that if it ever got everybody who they works, can trace it back yeah, to you everybody who works nefarious on, happen exactly and everybody who works on the film will get their copy with their name watermarked on it so that if ever gets out then they know whose copy it was um, so that comes like that I mean at one point Zhang Yimou was I think it was his it wasn't Hero, it was Warriors of Heaven and Earth. Zhang Yimou, the one who did the Beijing Olympics and uh, uh, raised the Red Lantern and all of that. Um, so he gives me this film and they were so paranoid about, about piracy that they gave me the bottom half of the film. <laughs> I'm like, but I can't is, subtitle boots. <laughs> like, I can't. The people's heads you know? that are doing the speaking are in the top half, are they not? Yeah, they speak in the top. I said, like, can you at least give me the top half? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it was so funny. Um, which they, they gave me the whole thing finally with my name like across the. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's a crazy world. But okay, so you get the film and you get. Um, you sometimes then also get the script for reference, uh, and then you get uh, what's called the spotting list. And the spotting list is... Um, uh, I was trying to explain this last night, Glee Books, and I thought, why can I discuss this all the time and I know exactly what it is and I can't quite get it out? But what it is is, okay, when people are talking, it's the, it's the subtitle. The spotting list breaks the dialogue down into subtitles, and subtitle length chunks of dialogue and those lengths are determined um, it's quite a technical process by how it's, it's, a, it's a matter of how much you can read and how long that language is on the screen in your ear as well so it's, it's a little bit of a a, it's like a mathematical formula yeah, for saying it is. how long it's, it's got to stay up there depending on how long the speech Exactly. Is. Right. It is a bit of a mathematical formula. It's probably a very simple one, but I'm not very good at math. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's... I think a, a subtitle is on the screen for three to seven seconds. Now, you have these different situations. The situation you were talking about just then is the sub, it's one of the subtitles nightmares because what happens with that is something like this... Um, 我今天就想跟你们解释这个翻译的问题，但是你们就是人太就是那个时间太短了，我不知道怎么办， right? And right. you know, I could say that even faster, really. But you know, it's just like uh, I was just making it up. I was saying, you know, I, there's so much to discuss, and and there's not enough time. And if I I could uh, if I'd thought about it, I could say it even faster. And if you say it that fast, the problem is is that there's that much language, but it becomes one subtitle because it's it's a certain amount of time on the screen and then it moves right. on it also has to do with what's oh, on so the screen so it's the speed of how how yeah. well they so if i was saying on the other hand if i was saying jiang jie ge fan yi de wen ti hen fu za er qie wo men shi jian bu duo Right, that could be broken into three lines, and you could, I could give you the full substance of each of those. But right, that's right. one of the problems. It's so, like digesting speed rather than yeah, yeah, okay. And and you can't, you can't actually go. Hold on, stop the film. <laughs> wait till I've translated all of that. <laughs> and people really cannot. We ha there's also formulas. So um, generally speaking, uh, subtitles should not be more than 42. Um, sorry, I'm thinking in Chinese. Gu, we call gu spaces, um, and I'll explain that. 42 spaces long. Now that means. A space can be a letter, and it can be a punctuation mark, and it can be a, um, a, a space between words. So, uh, so the word, uh, so so a subtitle is S O to space a uh, space S U B T I T L E, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So we've got thirteen spaces. 
so a subtile. So I could actually go 30 more, uh, 30 more spaces, and then it would be really too long for a subtitle, and I'd have to go on to the next line. Ideally, a subtitle shouldn't really be more than about 30 um, spaces. It's, it's a lot easier because you do want the people to be able to lift their eyes and look at the movie from time to time. <laughs> and also you do have to trust that the audience is on a subliminal level as well, getting something of the dialogue by the tone that it's being spoken in. And, you know, and the under- characters matter? You have to under- have an understanding of yeah. the characters who are speaking? Oh, absolutely. Them- so the process for me is... I get all this. I watch the film first. I don't look at... If I've read this, the script first, that's great. But otherwise, it all comes in, and I sit down, and I watch the film, and I just get into it. Um, and I try to pay attention when I think, oh, that line's going to be tricky, or that, that's going to be a bit of a difficult one. But, you know, I just basically watch it and get and think about the characters and think about the situations and the feeling of it, and is it supposed to be funny? Is it supposed to be... You know, is it swift and clever? Is it really ponderous and so on Um, and then I then sit down and I do a first through with the subtitles just a quick translation not looking in the dictionary but I use highlight so I highlight uh, one one color of highlight means check this one in the dictionary Um, double check you know that you really know what this one is and the other highlight means check that on the film because there's ambiguous language you don't know really who's saying this you know Who's saying this and why are they saying that? And are they laughing or are they crying? And um, so you have to look at the film. So then I take my translation and then I watch the film and I make notes. And I, oh, I looked in the dictionary first, then I do the look at the film, and then I do another one, another draft. And then I just keep, keep at it. Watch it, look at it, watch it, look at it, watch it, look at it. Are you ever really happy? Is there an end point or is it just a point where, where, where they say about fiction that you just give up on it? Well, there is the end point when, the, when they're going, you know... <laughs> I need it now. <laughs> I need it now. Um, but one of the things that you find is that you, you shorten and shorten and shorten as time goes on too, which is good. Subtitles have to be done in a very... Uh, you have to be conscious of the fact that people, unlike in a novel where people can read a long, weird, complex sentence and then go back (laughs) and double-check it, a subtitle goes and it's gone. Mm -hmm. And you want to give people information in a fairly linear manner that's... You you can't... What you don't want to do is make them have to stop in the middle of the film and go, what, what? And then they think they haven't seen what comes after that. And you're thinking about all those things. You're thinking about the fact that this is a film they're watching. Can I ask about the tools of the trade? I guess I always had the idea that if you were fluent, you were, you were fluent and you could just do these things and you sound pretty fluent to me. Um, but it's not quite like that. It's actually, uh, you've actually got to, got to have a, quite a library and, and get organised in that respect. I've got a very good library um, and I'm always adding to it. And I have dictionaries that are, I have a 1930-something missionary dictionary that has words for the the girdle that a working class person wears around their right. cloth pants and and it has a word for grain the the kind of junks that carry grain you know um, uh, things like that that you just don't have anymore and then I have dictionaries that are Cantonese slang um, dictionaries that are Taiwan words contemporary words neologisms um, most of the dictionaries I have are Chinese Chinese and then I have some Chinese English mm-hmm. um, so I have dictionaries of classical I have dictionaries of uh, gangster slang <laughs> I have dictionaries of pop culture, I have medical dictionaries. Wow. I love dictionaries. I'm like this dictionary fetishist. <laughs> <laughs> and when I go to China, it's like people go, I go to China a lot, and people are like, so what are you doing in China? I can never figure it out. I'm just like, oh, I'm off to China. They're like, what do you do in China? I'm like, um, I, I don't know, I'm uh, by dictionaries. <laughs> <laughs> But there's a story in here about that still wasn't enough and you had to ring, you have to ring somebody oh, sometimes. Oh, yes. Uh, the, the, yeah, this was uh, Chiang Kai-go's film um, Farewell My Concubine and that was amazing because that had Republican-era slang from Beijing. So it was 1920s, 30s, 40s, that era of Beijing's street language. Then it had opera uh, slang and opera um, jargon, a uh, Peking opera jargon. Then it had actual Peking opera language, which is oh, that is the that is the killer. Peking opera, yeah, language, because it's right. really dense and poetic and is full of allusions that every Chinese person knows. And and you're just like, oh my god, that's going to get lost. That's going to get lost. Um, but 
it also had cultural revolution um, sayings and slogans, and it was really full on. So everything I was kind of battling through and I was getting through, but there was this one scene where there's a theater and all these people are sitting there and it would be like, you're all sitting there and we haven't come. And um, uh, Kylie runs through going, my ho, my ho, my ho. <laughs> and literally it means horse after, right? I'm like, my ho. Horse after. My ho. What's my ho? Could not find it anywhere. It was nowhere. I had no idea what this expression was. So luckily, I have this kind of, well, he's passed away now, but he was kind of my Gandhier. He was my, my, one of my, go- he was like my godfather. He and his wife were my, kind of my Chinese parents. Um, and he, he's an op- Peking opera writer by the name of Wu Zuguang. Um, his wife, Xin Feng Xiao, was a famous Peking opera singer. Anyway, I called up Wu Zuguang in Beijing and I said, Oh, I'm doing this thing, Chung Haiga's movie, and Ma Ho is, me, has me completely stumped. <laughs> and he says, oh, that's theater slang. He theater says, that's slang. opera slang for <laughs> the, the actors are late or still making up, so, this, so the play is slightly delayed. Of course, of course. Now, that's the opposite problem, because the audience is hearing Ma Ho, two syllables, right? <laughs> And then you're going like, meh, 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 meh. <laughs> so obviously I had to sort of say, I, I can't remember what I did, but it was something like, um, there's been a delay. What can you do? <laughs> is it a kind of a thankless job? I mean, if a translator is doing their job well, it's almost like they're not even there. It's so seamless that you can't even see them. Many, many translators have made the point that um, the only time people notice translation is when it's bad. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I, I make all of my friends, um, for example, when Wong Kar Wai's The Grandmaster finally comes here, my friends know that they're going to have to come to the theater and they're going to have to be the ones who sit there while the people come in and they're cleaning up the popcorn already because we're going to go to the very last of the credits. <laughs> and at the bottom of the credits, it will have subtitles. Linda, Linda Javen. Javen. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you know who your real friends are. Exactly. Who stays to the end? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be having some question time very shortly. Um, You have ushers on either side of you with your microphone. So just while I give you a few minutes to prepare all your questions for Linda, I'm going to ask one of my own, which is tell me about the time you translated for Billy Bragg because I'm dying to hear about it. (laughs) It was very funny. Um, I was visiting Nick Jose, who's a novelist, but who was Australia's cultural counsellor at the time in China. And we both knew a fellow called Peter Jenner, who was a professor of Chinese at, then at the ANU, um, an English um, uh, Englishman originally. And Peter Jenner had, given, had called up Nick and had said, my brother is a rock manager. His brother had managed The Clash. How cool is that? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Pete Jenner had managed The Clash. And he said, and he's got this singer, and he, they'd done a tour in Japan, and he's coming to, they're going to spend a few days in China. Would you mind taking them around. And at the time, I must say, it was 1989, I hadn't heard of Billy Bragg, <laughs> so I had no idea. And Nick had neither, and we're like, oh, what kind of, you know, because I love rock and roll, I'm totally into it. But the idea of some English rocker, we're thinking like, you know, is he the television out the hotel window type, or is he the, you know, we're like that you wouldn't really want to deal with in China. <laughs> so we're thinking, wonder what he's going to be like, right? And then along comes Billy Bragg. And, you know, it was love at first sight, obviously. It has to be. Um, he's so delightful. And Pete was great. And anyway, we had said that we would spend one day with them. And then it turned into three. <laughs> and I still see Bill when he comes. Oh, so, wow. uh, anyway, that day, we ended up um, at... Uh, the home of a Chinese uh, rock musician and there were all these Chinese rockers and they're all sitting around and um, at that time there wasn't at that much cultural exchange in the rock sphere. Now it's pretty, there's a lot of music that comes in and out but at the time it was pretty special and even though they had never heard of Bill, <laughs> Billy Bragg either, um, they were pretty excited to have a live one. Um, so, <laughs> so Bill and I were sitting on this guy's bed, and I was translating for Bill, and everybody's sitting around, and they were asking him questions, and somebody said, I heard you're, I heard you're a socialist, but 
Why? And because um, in China, it's inconceivable that you would be a socialist if you didn't have to be. You know? <laughs> and so they, Bill, Bill goes into this beautiful long explanation of his socialism, and he's breaking every so often. And I'm giving the, you know, I'm translating, and. And he's going on and on. He's explaining the whole. I mean, I think he got into the poll tax. You know, he got into the, you know, Thatcher. And I mean, we're going on and on and on. And he finishes. And it was, you know, it was a very, it was, it was lovely. It was, it was a whole big heartfelt, heartfelt, kind of, yeah. coherent uh, explanation. And there was a silence. And then somebody went, "So, what kind of amp do you use when you perform?" <laughs> Let's get to the important questions, they were thinking. And we will take that as our cue to get to the important questions, which are yours. Thank Hello, you, Linda. madam. Hello, Linda. My name is Kate Ritchie, and thank Hi, you Kate. very much for your fantastic talk today and on 774 this morning. Oh, thank you. Um, I work for a specialist Chinese translation company, as oh, wow. it happens. I'm not a translator. I'm not that good. But uh, I have to say that the art of a subtitler is far, far more than a, a Chinese translator. Um, it, there are all those elements you mentioned about the timing, about not predicting the punchline, oh, about yes. when you've got two people speaking, about this, you know, the amount of text. And, of course, English takes up a lot more space than, than Chinese, as, as we That's all know. That's a really basic issue, it, absolutely. Yeah, a huge issue. Yes. Um, and I was going to say, I was at um, the Translating and Interpreting Awards, actually, uh, about uh, a couple of weekends ago, and SBS subtitling won an Outstanding Contribution Award, as they often and do because as you know their subtitling unit produces all that fantastic television that we see uh, here we're, we're so lucky to have them and their chief um, translation manager uh, Dr Jing Han you probably know her um, was talking about the approach they use and of course how it's all super super urgent because the program the doco is going to going to you know television tonight and they need need it you know now you and I know you know translation is always due yesterday um, and they were talking about the uh, various software programs that they use the one they use at the moment is called Swift and I wondered if you had um, explored that because that that does the mathematical analysis that you were talking about earlier um, how many characters on the screen how many lines and uh breaks it down to the individual uh, yeah. frames. No, I, um, I'm, I basically say, give me the spotting list. I don't... Uh, so someone else gives you that, f how many, yeah. how long that There was stay. one time, I mean, I did Hero for Zhang Yimou, and um, then the production company that he was working with, there was a production company with an office in Sydney, and they said to me... Um, you know, you're doing the spotting list, aren't you? And I said, no, you do the spotting list. Mm -hmm. You give me the Chinese dialogue broke, broken down. And they were like, oh, you know, we expect our translators to do that. And I'm like, really? Um, so that would be what they were looking for, Katie, mm -hmm. um, me to have Swift and to even know about Swift, which I didn't know until you said <laughs> those words. But I will, they are now inscribed on my heart. <laughs> um, <laughs> Should Linda I, ever need to, need to know where to go? Thank you. Well, no, that's really good because I think some people, so far it's been pretty lucky. I've just, you know, the people I work with say, here's the spotting list. Um, but that's good to know. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Kate. Sir. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks very much for an interesting talk. Uh, my name is Puya. I'm from, originally from Iran. Uh, I was wondering if you have also explored uh, sign language and gestures and body language in different uh, languages and cultures, because there are interesting similarities and differences. Yeah, that's um, right You mean sign language for the sign for the deaf? Or no, other, no, no, no. Oh, no. just general gestures, gestures and things. Gestures. I, I can give you an example. Yes. Like what is like thumbs up here is like middle finger in Iran, right? Um, and I've heard when Americans attacked Iraq, like, everybody giving them that because in Iraq it has the same language, but Americans, you know, misinterpret that as like yeah. good luck yeah. or something. Um, um, I'm, uh, yeah. Yes. I was wondering if you um, explored these this kind of uh, similarities or different um, differences in different languages. Or I explore it personally. Um, I'm very interested in that, and it's a really good point. Is it gu Guiam? Puyam. Oh, Puyam. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, and uh, I'm very interested in that, and I'm, I'm always observing that. Um, but it's not a, 
I haven't made an academic study of it, if you know what I mean. But that would be important but, watching the film. Oh, yes, it? watching a film, that is one of the things that you read when you're trying to ascertain whether uh, the person is angry or the person is approving or, you know, because sometimes the language is a little bit ambiguous. And so obviously on, you know, you're always looking at the signs that they, that they're giving because, um, and, and, obvi- and because my specialty is Chinese, um, I can read Chinese sign language and Chinese body language. Um, it's definitely a part of language. There's no question about it. Thank you. Any, Interesting question. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? There's a few at the front. Thank uh, you, ma'am. Hello, Linda. Hello. Uh, you seem to do all your interpreting from Chinese into English. Is there a reason, mm. specific reason, you don't do the other way around? Absolutely. I do believe that um, the best translations are done into one's native language. I'm talking about cultural and literary translations. So when we're talking about more technical translations, business translations, and so on, it doesn't really matter. We're not looking at literary style. But when we're looking at something that's culture-based, um, I really do believe that it's important. Now, there are some people who transcend that. Um, Pierre Rickman, Simon Lays, he can translate from English to French and French to English and Chinese to English and, you know, um, Chinese to French. Uh, and French and English are both his, his native tongue in that way. Uh, he was Belgian, but um, that's a very rare example. I mean, you, you know, you have people like um, Joseph Conrad and you have people like Li Yun and uh, Hajin, who really have such a, an amazing creative facility in that other language. But one of the things I do when I speak to students in China, um, at, uh, recently I, I spoke to uh, a class at Communication University, and they were all studying translation, and um, they are all very keen to translate Chinese films into English and to translate Chinese literature into English. And uh, when they ask me this question, I say, you know, I mean, this is one of the problems. Getting back to one of your original questions, um, Tony, was the thing about Chinese literature and, you know, why we're not reading more of it. The Chinese foreign languages press in Beijing um, uh, and other Chinese uh, publishers have used Chinese translators translating to English, and it just doesn't... It often is just not... Mm-hmm. It's just not good enough. You know, it's just not... It, it's not literary enough. It doesn't, it doesn't catch in the way the original catches. Um, and it's just, I do believe that translating into your native language, I also believe that you really have to be on some level. I mean, you might not do any other writing, but you have to be a writer. It is about cre- creating. It's, it's a creative act. It's a, an act of writing. So it's, you have to have a feel for language and a facility with expression. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for that question. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Patrizia Burley. I'm, I'm myself a translator and interpreter into Italian. Ah. Uh, but as a, as a translator, more, more than an interpreter, um, it may seem a flip up question, but it isn't. Have you ever thought, as an author, when you're writing, Have you ever thought, how is this going to be translated, if it ever is? And have you adjusted your language in view of the fact that it might have been translated or um, you have uh, left it, you know, in a challenging way, wondering, okay, what would happen if someone translated this? Or does the question ever occur to you? That's That's a a really great question, and it's a question that writers struggle with more and more. Um, I personally... It occurs to me sometimes. It's like, wow, how would you retranslate that? And then I go on. Um, I don't make any concessions to that. Maybe because I don't get translated enough. But (laughs) Um, my first book was translated into like, I don't know, 14 languages or something. But, um, uh, you know, in some of them I'm just like, how do they do that? I have no idea. Uh, But I don't actually allow myself, but I do know, and this is really interesting, I mean, that's why it's such an interesting question, That, and this has been discussed um, in some literary contexts. Um, there are writers who are writing towards a less uh, 
individualistic or a less culturally embedded style. Um, and Chinese people as well, um, people from all different cultures, um, are beginning to, there are definitely people who are writing global literature, mm -hmm. literature mm -hmm. that's easy to translate. Uh, and it's, it is quite interesting because, you know, you can do anything when you're writing. You can have the intent of, I mean, I always have the intent of writing an airport bestseller and it never happens. But, <laughs> you know, you can write with the intent of being easy to translate and you may never get translated. Uh, but you can also, I think that a writer just has to be true to their best method of expression, what is, what, what, they have to be true to their art, you know, a writer has to be, has to do what, what feels right for what they're writing. Um, but if it, you know, it, it is an interesting question because it, it, it does, it affects people who are writing in non-English language, uh, in other languages rather than English, because most translations, 50% of the world's translations are out of English. So we get translated. But other people don't. That's a very competitive field. So if you're a Danish uh, crime writer, um, for example, you might not want to embed it too much with, with Danish, although... There, you can't that? move for Danish crime you writers these it. days. But I was going to say that, you know, <laughs> you know, some people get away with, you know, what, what's that one with all the politics in it, you know? Organ. Yeah. Um, so who knows? But... Some people are moving in other cultures towards a more translatable version of their own language. Thank you, Patricia. At the back, sir. Hi, uh, my name's Fergus. I write for a website called China Spectator. So we we do, uh, you know, some there's translation that's necessary to do some of the reporting that we do. Um, I was. Wanting to hear from Linda uh, any examples of um, things being lost in translation, and what, what, an anecdote that comes to mind for me um, was when Kevin Rudd at Copenhagen called the Chinese um, rat fuckers, yep. um, and I found that particularly interesting because that term um, is actually from uh, that movie about Watergate. Was it? Um, all the President's Men. All the President's Men. So it was a political term, yeah. meaning sort of muckraking, um, and it was used in that sense. And Rudd was talking to Australian journalists who, you know, he probably presumed had seen that movie. Um, and, but it was lost in translation to them... And then when it was reported in the Chinese media, it was it translated into something very that's har a, harmless. That's a great question, Fergus. But, and, and Linda was, was flicking because she addresses just that example in her essay. <laughs> um, what I say here is, as for Rudd's comment at the Copenhagen Summit on Climate Change in 2010, that the Chinese were, quote, trying to rat fuck us, the spokesman for China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs commented, I don't know what happened exactly at that time and in that place, but I do know Prime Minister Kevin Rudd has always placed great importance on the China-Australia relationship. So I just <laughs> cannot believe what is being said in those reports. And then, and then I write... Translation, rat fucker, we'll deal with him in private. <laughs> <laughs> so, so as well as the foreign language to translate, there's the whole diplomatic speech that yeah. also needs translation into English. I mean, there's, you know, um, I also use getting back to swearing. There's a Chinese expression that's going around, diao si, which literally means penis thread. And it's... It's, it's a kind of an expression, it means a particular type of loser, and it's a male thing, obviously, and, the, and, it, and it's used in the context of, I'm not rich or tall or well-educated, I'm honest, I'm, I'm nice, I'm faithful, I'd be a really, really great husband and boyfriend, but I'm a penis thread, I'll never get a girlfriend. It's like, it's a kind of a loser because you're not a winner. You know what I mean? Um, and you, you just can't, like, how the hell? The only way you can translate that is just to say loser because you cannot possibly, you know, bring that over. <laughs> and we don't have anything that's, that's really quite like it. 
because it also implies a whole cultural hierarchy of what's the desirable male, et cetera, et cetera. And so, the, the male-female ratio, which is kind of out of whack. Yeah, so, you know, there are lots of things that do, you do kind of run up in the, against them and you're like, I think we're just going to have to do our best here. Uh, but it's very interesting that in the, the rat fucker example is... Um, uh, Oh, do we? No, no. Okay. Um, I was going to say that in diplomacy, there's a, there's an interesting level of this because there's what they they know they hear, what they say they hear, and what they report they hear. And I think what's going wrong at the moment with with this government in Indonesia and so on is that they're they're not quite getting that the you know things don't they're not understanding concepts of face and they're not understanding what translates well and what doesn't. And Kevin Rudd's outrageous rat, you know, they're trying to rat fuck us comment, that that kind of works in a way, in a way that what Abbott said to the Indonesians doesn't. And I happen to know that what, I happen to have inside information Chinese government source <clears throat> um, that Julie Bishop's <laughs> rather unnecessary intervention into the um, Senkaku Diaoyu island problem <laughs> has just them going like that does not translate well. <laughs> you, you know, there, there are things you can say that can be excused, and then there are things you say too directly that unfortunately can be translated but don't translate well at all. We're entering a very difficult period. On that note of our very difficult period ahead, <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, the quarterly essay is found in translation in, pra in Praise of a Plural World um, by Linda Javen. It's the ideal Christmas present for your <laughs> translation or Chinese friends. Uh, readings is at the back. They would love to sell you one. Linda would love to sign it. Um, and we'd like to thank you so much for coming along to the last of our Wheel of Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Tony. <laughs>